Evelyn. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I hope everybody's doing okay. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. I'm James Marfield with the More Church of Christ. Um, today's Bible study will focus on um, 1 Samuel 16, verses 1 through 13. And we're just getting into the new Foundations book. So if you're at home, get the red book, lesson one, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started in a little bit. What I'd like to do is go ahead and let's go to our Father in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we approach your throne this morning as eager students to learn more about the scriptures. We want your word to be seated into our hearts so that we can put them into, put your words into practice in our lives and in our community. Father, we ask for your guidance this morning that you work through me and through the body here to, to really emphasize the lessons that we'll read about in 1 Samuel today. Father, we also pray for your continued blessings with our outreach to the community, especially, Father, yesterday. We're very grateful for the opportunity to go and spread your word and some ice cream to the local community in the hopes that maybe they'll come out and, and join us for service one day. Father, we pray for all those on our prayer list, all those in our hearts, we pray that you, you shepherd them and, and their families and that you restore them according to your will, Father. We also pray for all of our, our elders and our volunteers in our church, everybody here and at home. Father, we pray that you bless them this week as we go out and do your work. Father, we pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. All right. So I thought the, I think the best place to start this morning would maybe just be to read this part of the Ford, uh, which kind of talks about the exploits of David. So if you'll bear with me, I'll go ahead and read that. So on two occasions, the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, and then Acts 13, verse 22. What does that phrase suggest? Among other things, it says some conduct or quality of David touched the heart of God himself. Just as David had the personality and the charisma to attract God's attention, he has captured the hearts of students of the Bible over the centuries. We are moved by his youthful fervor, his commitment to responsibility, his power of language as expressed in the Psalms, his personal appeal that stirred emotions in friend and foe alike. In some respects, he must be one of the most powerful figures in the Old Testament's history. A study of David does not concentrate so much on chronology, but on events and encounters. Like Jesus in John's Gospel, David reveals himself best in his dealings with a wide variety of individuals, especially in his one-on-one -on -one connections. This study of David will examine some of those contacts, good and bad, that make modern readers pull David into their hearts and minds and wonder how he could be so humble and so guilty at the same time. These lessons this quarter examine the life of Samuel, his family, Goliath, Jonathan, Saul, Nabal, Abigail, Michael, Mephibosheth, Bathsheba, Uriah, and Nathan. Each encounter will offer food for thought and lessons to be learned. So, as is typical with the Old Testament, I can struggle sometimes with names, so I'll apologize in advance if, if I, I uh, mess one of those up. But at any rate, what we'll do is sort of go into a kind of an overview. Uh, I want to bring you up to speed, so to speak. So what we're going to do is go through slides. Um, the, the other, the other uh, chapters of the book before we get into 16, just to give some context. So um, as the last of the judges and a prophet of Israel, Samuel fulfilled virtually every possible leadership role for Israel, seer or prophet, you know, priest, judge, prophet, and military leader. So both books of Samuel cover about 125 years from 990 to 865 BC. And we're also not sure who the author is, uh, but Samuel may have written chapters 1 through 25. And there are numerous theories about who the rest, uh, who, who could have done the rest. So it could be a combination of Samuel, uh, Gad, and Nathan. Uh, but there is really not a consensus, if you will. So. All right, so we'll first get into just a quick kind of a 30,000-foot overview here of chapters uh, 1 through 3. So it starts with really describing Hannah's 
uh, barrenness and her vow. Uh, so when we think of his, Samuel's parents, uh, his mother's Hannah, his father, uh, Elkanah. So Elkanah had two wives, Peninnah, who had children, and then Hannah, who was barren or infertile. Elkanah and his family, uh, it, as we go through the, this, uh, this chapter, they journey to the tabernacle, and then Hannah offers up a godly vow. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. So Eli, the high priest, watches Hannah's silent prayer. Hannah responds to Eli's accusation. He suspected that she was drunk. She was praying so fervently, and she was so uh, in such deep sorrow. Um, but Eli answers with a blessing when he figures out she's not drunk, and, and uh, she makes that case. Eli says, go in peace, and the God of Israel will grant your petition, which you have asked of him. Then we get to the birth and the dedication of Samuel, Samuel's miraculous conception and his birth. And that's described, and so it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I asked for him from the Lord. Hannah keeps the child until he's weaned and then dedicates Samuel to God's service. And that's described in the verse, then they slaughtered a bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore, I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. Then Hannah offered a prayer. After leaving Samuel with Eli, Hannah prayed a great prayer featured in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Hannah's prayer starts with a praise for a specific act of God and then expands to offer universal praise of God. Hannah's prayer start, uh, one scholar summarized Hannah's prayer as Hannah's prayer eloquently celebrates the holiness and sovereignty of God and affirms the central tenets of Israel's faith. Not only is Hannah's prayer a testimony of God's handiwork in her own life, but it is also a foreshadowing of his actions in the lives of the prophet Samuel, King David, and the nations of Israel. In chapters 2 and 3, Samuel's godliness is juxtaposed with Eli's two wicked sons, and, and all three of which die later on in the, in, in the book. But Eli's sons, Phinehas and Hophni, were installed in the priest's office as officiating priests at the sanctuary of Shiloh, despite lacking their father's godliness and, and his good qualities. They were guilty of not growing in their faith, showing disrespect for sacrificial processes, and fornicating with women at the door of the tent. And just a, a quick note, Moses had delegated this service at the door of the tent to women, i.e., uh, likely the washing of utensils or doing the cooking of the meats that were sacrificed. Um, and his two sons basically, um, you know, uh, attempted to fornicate, if you will. So um, while Eli warned of his sons of their wickedness, he failed to really rebuke them. Uh, and to rebuke, again, is to reprimand strongly. Uh, to, to strongly warn, to restrain. So he failed in that respect as a father, and so he was very weak in that respect. Eli should have exerted his formidable fatherly authority and rebuked his sons as the judge, but Eli merely managed to mildly reason with them, stating, why do you, why do, you do such things? Meanwhile, Samuel, uh, on the other hand, again, there's a juxtaposition there, was growing in his faith. And, for example, 1 Samuel 3, verse 19, As Samuel grew, and Jehovah was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. All right, now we're going to just do a quick review of chapters 4 through 7. And sorry, I have to hold my laptop like this because uh, I just do. <laughs> but I know it looks weird. Uh, but in chapter 4, uh, we see where 4,000 Jews died at the hands of uh, the Philistines, and after bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the fight, they lost an additional 30,000 men, and they then lost 50,000 men after breaking God's law by looking at the Ark. Phineas and Hophni, again, Eli's sons, who were unmotivated to become faithful and obedient, died during the battle. In 1 Samuel 4, verse 17, 
So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of the God has been captured. And then again in verse 18, Then it happened, when he made mention of the ark of the God, that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For that man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel for 40 years. So Eli was 98 years old at the time. So why would God allow Israel to lose so many? God would not be with the people who had, not, who had tolerated the sins of Eli's sons. Chapter 7, Samuel tells Israel to repent of their idolatry and to cease tolerating sin as they did with Eli's sons and secured God's protection and favor. So Samuel preaches inward and outward repentance. In 1 Samuel 7, verses 3 to 4, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the asterisks from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the land of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the balls and the asterisks, and serve the Lord only. And then in um, verse 6, the Israelites finally got God's message when they avowed, We have sinned against Jehovah. Samuel goes on to atone for Israel in chapter 7, and I'll read verse 10 through uh, 13. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, and drove them back as far as, uh, as, far as below Bethkar. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mesphah and Shin, and called it its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Samuel led Israel to a great victory over the Philistines after, God's, after God hears his faithful prayer. In 1 Samuel 7, verses 9 through 13, and Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offerings, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back. And again, I think we, I'm just repeating another verse that we had talked about, but I think we get the message here that uh, the Lord was with Samuel and Israel. So we're going to get into chapters 8 through 12. Chapter 8, uh, the proposal of the elders of Israel to install a king was angrily rebuked by Samuel as unfaithfulness to Yahweh, the God of Israel. Samuel warned the nation of the consequences of a monarchy. And I'll read some verses. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. And some will run before the chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties and will set some to plow the ground and reap his harvest and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers, and will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, and your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage, and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants and your female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, and put them to work. He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants, and you will cry out in that day, because your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. So a pretty clear and stark warning from Samuel to the people of Israel who, who wanted a, a human, a, a male king. Chapters 9 through 10, Saul and his servant search for his father's donkeys, and then they meet Samuel. God tells Samuel that Saul is the man who, who will be king. This is described in 1 Samuel 9, verses 15 through 17. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may serve my people from the hand of the Philistines. 
For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, There he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. By the revelation of, revelation of God, however, Samuel anointed Saul king and installed him before all of Israel. Chapters 11 through 12, uh, Saul was vindicated as king by his Israeli leadership in a campaign against the Ammonites. Uh, and then uh, eventually um, Samuel retires from the leadership of Israel. Okay. Now we're going to transition into... Um, the last uh, few chapters before we get into today's lesson. So chapter 13, just a real quick overview. Um, Saul assembles Israel's first standing army. Jonathan initiates conflict with the Philistines. The Philistines prepare their army. Saul offers the burnt offering, an unlawful sacrifice. Samuel arrives and Saul tries to explain what he did, but Samuel proclaim, proclaims God's judgment upon Saul's household. The Philistines begin their raids, and there's a technological superiority with the Philistines. Uh, the Israelites had no blacksmith and uh, just sort of rudimentary weapons, so they were really outmanned. Saul was rejected as king, not specifically because he offered sacrifices, but because he disobeyed a direct command that God had given him through the prophet Samuel. Samuel had told Saul, go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. But Saul worried that his whole army would desert him and offered the sacrifices himself before Samuel arrived. And that's kind of a thing. Um, um, Saul wants to do things his way. He doesn't trust in the Lord. He, he's not very faithful. In that respect, chapter 14, Saul's son Jonathan trusted God and boldly went to the Philistine garrison and finds a strategic narrow pathway through large shop rock formations uh, with the thinking that, you know, a limited number of people with rudimentary objects could fend off a more advanced, larger army by virtue of, of the strategic advantage. And if you, anybody's read about the 300, same kind of scenario where we have a, a very limited pathway where it's almost like a force multiplier because they have to get through that little bottleneck to get to, uh, you know, the forces that they're trying to defeat. And therefore, just a few men can, can hold up a nice uh, blockade that way. But um, again, uh, God guided Jonathan because of his bold trust in him. Jonathan is an armor bearer who was an assistant to Israelite officers. They attacked the Philistines. God aided Jonathan by sending a great earthquake that terrified the Philistines. Saul learned of the battle and then comes to the fight. And then there is a great victory. Saul put Israel, the Israel army under an oath where he foolishly tried to exert spiritual authority that he did not have. That would be Samuel's role, if you will. Um, he also took the focus away from God. He also took the focus away from where God would have wanted it which would have been, you know, likely Jonathan and his faithfulness. So Saul made an additional foolish oath. Then we get into chapter 15. Uh, God rejects Saul as the king. A clear command from God. I will, punish, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So God's upset, <laughs> but God's very clear. It's total annihilation, uh, and that is the command from God. So Saul attacks the, Am the uh, Amalekites, and then God regrets naming Saul the king. I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. And then Saul was rejected as king, and really just sort of offered when he attempted to repent and, or attempted to apologize, it was very weak. It was not uh, genuine. It, was, uh, it lacked in faith. So um, it, it didn't do the job. So essentially what, what, what Saul did is, is he, he didn't kill the king. You know, he saved the king, and, and then... Save some of the better uh, 
the more valuable items, if you will. And so he did not perform the total annihilation that God had commanded. So now we're going to get into today's lesson. Uh, God chooses David. This is again First uh, Samuel 16, verses 1 through 15. And I think we've got some new dedicated readers in, in uh, Gene and Evelyn. So if you all wouldn't mind reading those, um, and I can bring them up on the screen if that will. How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? And the horn is far Saul, I am sending you to Jesse, the best life, for I have divided myself a kingdom among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hears he will kill me? And the Lord said, Take a hand for me to say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem and in the elders of the town and trembled at his coming and said, do you come in peace with me? And he said, peace with me. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Turn your step. Sanctify yourself and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his son and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eli and said, Surely the Lord, the Lord anointed before him. But the Lord said to him, And do not look at the appearance of all his physical statutes because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as a man. job uh, getting through those Old Testament names. <laughs> That's a struggle for me, I'll tell you. Uh, but uh, anyhow, so um, to we're going to explore uh, verses 1 through 3 first here as God tells Samuel to go and anoint a new king over Israel. Uh, you know, some of the takeaways here, how long will you mourn for Saul? So while it's understandable and even in God's eyes to mourn, you know, there's, there's a time where that needs to end and uh, faith in God needs to prevail and we need to move on. And I think that's a lesson for all of us. Um, also, fill your horn with oil. Samuel likely would have immediately realized that God wanted him to anoint someone other than Saul as king. Um, and we can see that God is moving on. And even though Samuel seems bridal to the idea of Saul being king, God shows that he's in control and is willing and able to make the change. So he also said that I am sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, and that Israel's next king would be found among his sons, uh, the sons of Jesse. So Jesse uh, was the grandson of Ruth and Boaz, or Boaz, and uh, that's uh, indicated in Ruth 4, verses 17 and 22. So why Bethlehem? So obviously, uh, you know, Bethlehem was a small, out-of-the-way town, uh, but God, knowing that his son would be born of David's lineage and that David was of a family of Bethlehem, so it sort of makes sense, right? And also, when you think of Bethlehem and Jesus' birth, um, God knows that people are going to be looking for Jesus. So 
it, why, you know, what better to pick a remote, more remote location uh, than, than somewhere that, you know, uh, uh, a more populous area where, uh, you know, it'd be easier maybe to be found. Uh, so back then, obviously, they didn't have the internet news, so it would have been harder for information to travel, uh, which would probably have given uh, Jesus, you know, more time. So anyways, that's kind of the thinking maybe about the choice of Bethlehem. Um, then we, we looked at the words, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And it's so obviously easy to see why there's fear with Samuel. Um, Saul would assuredly see what he did as a total betrayal, treason. Um, but I suspect also that God was maybe disappointed that such a godly man uh, would lack sort of the fate and would really fret over, you know, dying a mortal death while God was protecting him. Um, but again, it's, it is easy to see why Samuel would be concerned. But why was Saul, Samuel so concerned and to mourn over him? What, what was the, the part of that? Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe failure. failure. Uh, you, you know, know it was God's, God's plan and it didn't, it didn't seem to be working out. out and uh, uh, maybe, maybe he, this is just my thinking, but maybe he took some personal responsibility for that. And, um, and I'm sure there's there's some other uh, work. Right. Um, you know, I was thinking about that too, and I was just so what kind of came to mind is this is just sort of a failure, maybe a personal failure of Samuel that he wasn't able to uh, maybe do his part to keep Saul straight. So uh, that's, that was one thing that came to mind. I don't know if anybody else has anything to offer on that. But. trying to maybe penalize Israel for not wanting to embrace him as the king, that they want this other sort of pseudo king, somebody in the flesh that they can see. And Saul looked like a king. Saul was kind of looked the part. When you think about David, not really so much, right? David was more meek in stature and that sort of thing. So maybe this is a lesson too, that uh, maybe God all along knew that this wasn't going to work out. And, uh, you know, and this is a lesson to Israel. So it's not always, you know, the judge a book by the cover kind of scenario, right? So he was very superficial. Michael touched on that where he was just sort of on the surface, yeah, abiding by things, but it wasn't in his heart. So I think there's something to that too. Yeah, this is great. Um, so how can I go? If Saul's here, he would kill me. So anyways, we talked about that. Uh, that it's really easy to understand uh, why he was fearful, but then uh, it's also a, we struggle because God had been with him and God had done miraculous things. So why would he fear when God's got his back? But uh, anyways, he said, I will show you what you shall do. And again, this kind of echoes God's obviously his ultimate control over everything in the entire universe. And uh, this also likely instilled confidence in Samuel 
and he probably needed a little confidence because he was a little shaky there. Um, uh, but so that maybe would have lessened the burden and stress, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, for, for Samuel. All right, so now we get into uh, verses 4 to 5, Jesse's house. So Samuel comes to sacrifice at Bethlehem. So Samuel did what the Lord asked him to do. He went to Bethlehem, again, small town near Jerusalem. So back in the day, you know, we didn't have Uber. This was going to be about a one-hour, 45-minute walk or so. Um, so it wasn't too far. And, uh, but Bethlehem was home again to Ruth and Boaz, parents to Jesse, grandparents to David. Um, and just sort of for a kind of a lay of the land, I'm, I'm, Bethlehem may have looked a little bit like eastern Kansas, but uh, rolling hills, small grain fields, um, and uh, in, in the picture there, that's just a picture uh, picked off the internet there, but depicts a group, uh, Ruth gathering leftover grain. But, and then, uh, you know, with the, some more takeaways. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? Any, any idea why they would be worried at this point? an event too that they may have heard about um, we didn't we didn't talk about it today but um, if you recall well you may not recall it because we didn't cover it today but Samuel brutally killed uh, I may miss this up but Agag uh, in the name of God and specifically hacked him to pieces before the Lord and Gilgal so uh, this was after um, Saul's failure to do the job and so maybe potentially they had heard about that as well, and that was on their mind. Um, so, but definitely he had a reputation. Um, so there were they understandably were probably concerned. Also, come with me to the sacrifice. So uh, the the idea was not that Jesse and his sons were to just watch Samuel sacrifice the cow. Uh, they would watch the sacrifice and then share in a large ceremonial meal eating the, the meat that came from the sacrificed animal. So when animals were sacrificed to atone for sins, no part of the animal was eaten and, and burned before God. But animal sacrifices, peace offerings, fellowship offerings, or consecration offerings were partially burned and other parts eaten in ceremonial fashion. So now we get to um, Jesse's house and God doesn't choose any of Jesse's older sons. So surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Uh, the, the takeaway there, when Samuel looked at Jesse's oldest son, Eliab, he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him, him being God. As Samuel saw a tall, handsome man who appeared like he would be a great king and leader and likely would have been easily received by Israel. So we are, so you know, when you're thinking, put yourself in Samuel's shoes, you know, God had chosen Saul, and Saul looked the part, and he probably assumed that part of God's reasoning was because of his stature that the Israelites would follow Saul. So maybe he's sort of conditioned to think, well, this is the most impressive of the group. Surely this is the guy, a uh, handsome guy, and appears like he would be a good king. But how, <laughs> it's still... It's pretty shallow, right? Looks the part, but we don't know anything about the character of um, Iliad. Uh, but God instructed, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have refused him. So obviously Samuel kind of made an error in judgment uh, just based on looks alone. And 
this does sort of echo historical flaws with the Jews, placing just too much emphasis on worldly or, or you know, fleshy, fleshy dynamics, if you will. Uh, this was the same uh, mistake that Israel had made about their first king. Uh, you know, he, he, he looked the part, but, you know, he didn't have the heart of a king that, of God's pe that God's people should have. So um, it doesn't matter how good Eliab looked because God said, I have refused him. So God's in charge. Um, then uh, another piece here. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So that's echoed throughout the scriptures that the Lord knows what's, what's in the heart. You can't fool the Lord. Um, this was both a statement of fact and an exhortation of godly thinking. First, it was a statement of fact. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Even the best of men will look at the outward appearance. At the moment, Sam, Samuel was guilty of it. We must understand that we can't read the secrets of another's heart, and we often do only judge on outward appearance. The world is full of idolatries, so we have to sort of keep that in mind uh, as we're evaluating situations in our lives. Uh, we can't be seduced by outward stuff, right? Um, it was also an exhortation to godly thinking. God told Samuel, your natural inclination is to only judge on outward appearance but I can judge the heart that you can't see. So look to me and don't be so quick to judge a person only on their outward appearance. Samuel needed to know his natural inclination to judge only on outward appearance, but he didn't want, have to give into it. He could seek the Lord and seek the God's heart and mind when looking at people. So this is a lesson I think for all of us in virtually everything, not, not only just judging people, <laughs> judging a car. <laughs> Right, Tommy? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can buy the prettiest car, but if it's got a bad powertrain, it's... You add something, Wally? I was going to add to you. I might be added. Remember that there are a lot of people that are higher than you say, and they can be super important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. Position, That's a great right point. We need all of them. Yeah. The, the youngest that gets most of the attention, right? And the oldest is left to their devices. Uh, so it's kind of backwards, but. He spoke of God. He did these other things. 
God's judgment was very quick. Mm -hmm. And so if they were in the wrong for something, you know, is he coming to destroy us? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, it, it gets kind of dicey if you're in that time and don't. They didn't have any better understanding than, than Samuel did as to God's purpose and stuff. Samuel yeah. was a prophet of God and he did what God told him, but it's just like the, the apostle, you know, they didn't understand. Yeah. They didn't have a full understanding. Yeah, yeah and we're, we still are in the Old Testament, so God keeps <laughs> teaching lessons here. And I think, I think this is big, a, big, a big lesson, right? I'll, I'll show them, I'll show them. You know, and, and he did. He, he, he gave the person that looks the part, but was a failure. And then we get, we're going to get to David, who doesn't really look the part, but it's the heart. It's the heart. Yeah, it's what's on the inside, not, what on, the, not, not on the outside. And that's echoed here quite a bit. Uh, by the Lord. So, um, so the Lord has not chosen these. So God told Samuel that he had not chosen any of the seven sons of Jesse attending the feast. And it wasn't that these sons of Jesse were bad men, but they were not God's choice. And God had a man in mind different from Samuel's or Jesse's expectations as we've seen. Um, Eliab and the seven oldest sons of Jesse were ideal potential kings in terms of looks are, you know, worldly, fleshy concerns. Uh, but God didn't want a king after the flesh. Uh, Israel already went down that road with Saul. So God wanted a man of strong faith and a character. All right. So a couple of key verses here are all the young men here. So Samuel was in a predicament. He knew God didn't want any of the seven sons present, presented thus far, and therefore knew there must be another son somewhere. So then we see uh, that there remains the youngest. Now we see how low David's status was among his brothers. Jesse failed to even recognize him when Samuel, until Samuel pressed. So, and, and Wally hit on this earlier, but ancient culture was very different than today's typical, you know, family dynamic. Um, the youngest boy in a family received little regard in ancient times, especially in a large family with, with so many older sons. Whereas in today, we just talked about that. Typically, it's the youngest that's kind of getting spoiled the most. But uh, another one, and there he is, keeping the sheep. David was out keeping the sheep when he was beckoned to be anointed. So God likely favored David because he was a dutiful shepherd and did what his father requested. Keeping the sheep was a servant's job. The fact that David was out keeping the sheep showed that the family of Jesse was not especially wealthy because if they were wealthy, a servant would be keeping the sheep. But they were not affluent enough to have servants. Um, keeping this, and by the way, I'm borrowing some of this uh, commentary from, uh, from the interweb, <laughs> but, but it, it made sense, so, but I'm citing some of that right now. Keeping the sheep meant you had time to think. Um, David spent a lot of time looking over sheep and looking at the glory of God's creation. God built in him a heart to sing about his glory in all creation. Um, as we saw in Psalm 19 and Psalm 8, keeping the sheep took a special heart, a special care. It meant you knew how sheep needed the care and help of a good shepherd. You learned that you were a sheep and God was your shepherd. During these years, God built in David the heart that would sing about the Lord as a shepherd, as we saw in Psalm 23. Keeping the sheep meant you had to trust God in the midst of danger. David had lions and bears and wolves to contend with, and the sheep had to be protected. The country of Bethlehem was not a peaceful paradise, and the career of a shepherd was not the easy life of lovesick swains, which poets dream, and that was a, a quote from uh, um, Lockie. David's years keeping sheep were not waiting time, they were training time. David was a great man and a great king over Israel because he never lost his shepherd's heart. And that's echoed in Psalm 78. Speaks of the connection between David the king and David the shepherd. He also chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the ewes that had young he brought them, to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel. 
his inheritance. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. Try struggling with devices over here. All right, then we get into uh, the final two verses. Um, now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. So while David had a pleasing appearance, he did not possess the appearance of Saul. And as Dell indicated, really tall guy, you know, very impressive stature. So, um, so basically he didn't necessarily look like a king. Um, but again, looks can be deceiving, and that's kind of the moral here. Mankind has long been distracted by outward superficial qualities, which if you think about it, it's really kind of lazy. If we just default to what everything looks like, we don't have to do the, the analysis, right? The uh, examination. So it's kind of lazy. Um, so uh, we need to be more introspective and spiritual as we evaluate things. Uh, there are many analogies. It's, it's rare that the best looking person or thing performs the best. And we can probably relate our days at school or in the workforce, you know. Um, again, it's really what matters on the inside. It's not outward appearance. Also, um, there's no consensus on how old David was at the time. Uh, the ancient Jewish historian uh, Josephus says that David was 10 years old, but others argue he could have been as old as 15. That's really not that important. Maybe somebody's got a more important note, but to give some perspective, he was he was pretty youthful. Um, basically, probably, uh, you know, middle-aged kid. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. So God described what made David special in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord had commanded him to be the commander over his people. What made David the one was that he was a man after God's own heart. So you, you see a s sort of a stark delineation from how Saul was described. Um, you can definitely see that, that David was more precious to God. Uh, like David, you and I don't need to be the best looking, most successful, or most intelligent to garner God's favor. It, it's really, you know, it's your faithfulness and your obedience to the word. How did, God gain, how did David gain so much favor with God? In Psalms, David characterizes his mother as a maidservant of the Lord. Uh, and that's in Psalm 86 and 116. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. So from the actions of David, Jesse, and David's brothers, after this we can assume that only God and Samuel knew exactly what happened here. Everyone else probably thought that Samuel just honored David for an unknown reason. Probably no one even dared to think that this was a divine royal anointing. But God knew uh, because he had worked in David's heart for a long time. The public anointing was the outcome of what had taken place in private between David and God for, for quite a while. Also, another takeaway, and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So the, the real anointing happened when the Holy Spirit came upon David. The oil and the head was just a sign of that inward reality. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Samuel did not begin Samuel did not begin a let's enthrone David political party and he did not begin to undermine Saul's throne looking for a way to establish David as king. Samuel took one look at David and reacted exactly the way God wanted him to. And he said, Lord, I don't know why you chose this kid, but you will have to put him on the throne. I can't do it. God did do it. And that was mentioned uh, or talked about in uh, verse 13. It's the first mention of the name David in the book of 1 Samuel. He's been referred to prophetically before uh, in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, and 1 Samuel 15, verse 28. But this is the first mention of his name, which means beloved, our loved one. David will become one of the greatest men of the Bible, mentioned more than 1,000 times in the pages of Scripture, more than Abraham, more than Moses, more than any mere man in the New Testament. 
It's no accident that Jesus wasn't known as the son of Abraham or follower of Moses, but as the son of David, as echoed in Matthew 9, verse 22, and at least a dozen other places. From whatever side we view the life of David, it is remarkable. It may be that Abraham excelled him in faith and Moses in the power of concentrated fellowship with God and Elijah in the fiery force of his enthusiasm. But none of these was so many sided as the richly gifted son of Jesse. And that was a quote from uh, a, a commentator, Meyer. All right. Any uh, observations before we get into looking at the questions? All right. So, question number one. What did God tell Samuel he had done to Saul? And this was in uh, verse 1, chapter 16. over Israel. Question two, why was Samuel afraid to go to Bethlehem? Right. Samuel's worried Saul would have him killed. Three, why, what was Samuel supposed to take with him to Bethlehem? And that was in verse two. Exactly. How did the elders of Bethlehem react to Samuel's arrival? Yeah, they, they were scared. <laughs> hey, are you coming in peace or are you here to kill us or something like that, right? All right. How did God say he evaluated individuals? He was at their heart. Exactly. What was David, David doing, doing when Samuel was... inspected his brothers? Yes. He did the sheep. That's right. Last but not least, what happened to David after he was anointed in verse 13? The Spirit of the Lord came on him. There we go. Awesome. Well, it looks like we're good on time. Does anybody have any final thoughts? Or? All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's attention today, and we'll be back next week with uh, the second lesson in the Foundations book. So, appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome.